Hey dad, it is your firstborn Crystal and I wanted to wish you a very happy 71st birthday. It has been my joy and remains my joy to be your daughter. Uh, you are a man of integrity, of character, of wisdom, of knowledge and vision and to have had the privilege for um, a lot of your life to be your daughter. <laughs> I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to see what God has done in your life, and I'm grateful to have a close and front seat to see what God continues to do in your life. I want you to know that you have been and remain a blessing to me, and I love you. Happy birthday, Daddy. I just wanted to say again, happy birthday, and that I love you beyond words. I honor you beyond words. I cherish the fact that I uh, I get to carry your name. That means the world uh, to me. So I, I, with all the stuff that we've, we've gone through um, with our family and with our church and with our world, I couldn't wish that you would have a happier birthday. I couldn't wish that anymore for you, especially at this time. So I love you very much. And uh, I'm coming over to the house in a few minutes. So see you soon. Happy birthday, Daddy. I just wanted you to know that I love you so much. I admire you for so many reasons, more reasons than I will ever have an opportunity or time to tell you, but I'm going to sure try. I love you so much. Happy, happy birthday, Dad. Hey, happy birthday, Dad. Just wanted to say I love you. Happy birthday to you. And when I'm 71, I want to look just like you. How are you going to be an old man and a young man all at the same time? Keep it up. Keep your energy up. Listen, I want to be just like you because I know if I'm like you, I'm just like Christ. So I'm following you. So keep going. I'll keep going. We'll keep going. We got your back. Love you. Welcome everyone, and I am so excited that we are here again this Sunday from wherever you are all over the country and the world. It doesn't matter because we're together. It's Sunday morning and we're gonna worship together. And I'm also excited because it is my dad's 71st birthday. So say happy birthday in your dens, in your living room, wherever you are, to Dr. Tony Evans, 71 years old, and he's still kicking strong. Y'all continue to keep him in prayer in this season. He's having a birthday, his first birthday, uh, without my mom. Uh, but he, he's growing, he's continuing to heal, he's continuing to get more energy, and as you know, he's still preaching that word. So keep him in your prayers during this time, but also continue to celebrate him as we celebrate the Lord together. I'm excited to worship, we're excited to get in the word as he continues the Kingdom Voting Series. And remember, we're gonna commune together as well. So you wanna get your, your cracker together, you wanna get your juice or your water, because we wanna to commune together at the end of our service. So let's get ready, because I'm excited. Let's worship right now. Come on, clap those hands. Come on, everybody. Yeah. Father, we honor your presence this morning. We magnify your name. We say, you are the Lord. You are the Lord God Almighty. You're perfect in everything perfect. you do. in 
the sky. We lift your name on high. Say it again. Let creation sing. Let our creation sing your praise. And all your people, Father, shine. desire is that the glory of the Lord would settle right where you are that the glory of the Lord the presence of the Lord the manifested presence of the Lord would bring peace right where you are yes, Jesus. purify our hearts Lord Purify our hearts, Lord. Sanctify our hearts, Lord. Sanctify our hearts, Lord. Oh, Lord, we need you. It's Jesus. We need to see you we're desperate for you now let your glory settle here ha. settle here help me say that in the room purify our hearts Purify our hearts, Lord. Father, this morning, wash us, sanctify us, and make us clean. Sanctify our hearts, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. Sanctify. To see you, we need to see you. We're desperate for you. Now let your glory settle. Hey, Father, that's our hearts cry this morning. Hey, settle. Father, as long as we have you. We don't need anything else. Settle. Settle. Rest in the room, Father. Right where we are, Jesus. We need you. Hey. Settle. Right there where you're seated. I want you to lift up your hands before the Father. I want you to open up your mouth and give him praise right there where you are. As if your very life depended upon it. Now we sing to the Father. Hey, come on and take your seat. Our burdens at your feet. With you we can't be beat. Won't you settle? Won't you settle here? Come on and take your seat. Yes, God. Take your right. 
Well, hello, folks, to our OCBF Church family and to our guests who are joining us from all over. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us today. It's a, it's a special honor to be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ through ministering to you as we all seek to bring glory to him. Well, we hope you're being challenged by this series on kingdom voting. I know it's, uh, it's challenging. We're already getting all kinds of responses from folks everywhere. But we're trying to stay true to the Word of God since um, God created government. And that's what we're going to talk about this week, God and government, as part of this Kingdom Voting series. You stick with us because uh, I think you're going to be interested to hear some of the things God has to say to us as we walk through this journey together. In the meantime, I want you to know that we are here to serve as best we can. If you live in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, uh, and you would like to know about becoming a part of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, we have online membership and you can go to ocbfchurch.org forward slash membership and find out about how to become part of our church and all the ministry that we have in store for you if you feel that we can be a blessing to you. And so we have various online classes coming up called membership or pre-membership classes and you're welcome to become a part of our family. Also, to our members, I want to remind you that on Wednesday night, you have your discussion groups about my sermon on Sunday. And so you can uh, send in your questions and the members will get in groups and, and uh, talk about some of the questions that, uh, that we have to deal with as we look at all that we're being challenged with. But for everybody, the single summit is coming up September 18th and 19th. It's going to be the bomb, okay? It's going to be something for everyone. The ministry of God's Word, what it means to be single and free, uh, what it means to enjoy and worship with great music, what it means to laugh with a great comedian as well. So go online, ocbfchurch.org uh, forward slash single summit and, uh, and you register so that you can be part of this amazing gathering. And remember that your faithful support of this ministry allows us to keep this ministry coming your way with strength. And this ministry is not only preaching, teaching, and singing. It's community engagement. It's, uh, it's addressing the issues of needs. It's, uh, it's enhancing people's lives because the church isn't just for Sunday. It's for all week long. And so your faithful tithes and your offering, if you're not a member of our church, please support your pastor and the church you're a part of. And then if God gives you extra because this church is ministering to you, then you're welcome to give an offering. But we don't want you to forsake your local church because the church of Jesus Christ has never been needed more than it's been needed, than it's needed right now. Well, thank you for the privilege of ministering to you and walking along sight of you and serving you. And let's continue in our worship as we see the good things that God has for us, even when it comes to our civic responsibility. Yes, Jesus. 
Father, we give you glory. We magnify your name, Jesus. This is our cry. The Lord bless you and keep and keep you. Make his face shine on. Yes, Jesus. Be gracious to you. Say that with us. May his faith upon you and the found generation and your children. Yes, Jesus. Your children and their children. May his faith be upon you and the found generation and your children and their children. Yes, Jesus. May his faith be
this morning. It is our prayer and desire. May he give. May he give peace. In the midst of trying times, may. May, he give oh, oh, give you peace. may the peace of the Lord surround you. May. that passes all understanding may he give you peace, he give you peace. every day in my elementary school and beyond in Baltimore, Maryland, where I grew up, the teacher would have all the students to stand. He or she would have us place our hands over our heart and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In that urban Baltimore school, I was reminded day in and day out, as most were, that we were to recommit ourselves to fidelity to the nation. What we were being reminded of was a covenantal commitment to the country. The concept of a national covenant, an agreement to commit yourself to the well-being of the, of the benefits that accrue because you belong to a country is not an American concept, it's a biblical concept because the Bible endorses covenants. In God's kingdom, he has four covenantal relationships. A personal covenant where you pledge fidelity to him as an individual. A family covenant where marriage and the family places themselves under his covenant. Then there would be the church covenant, where a body of believers placed themselves underneath him. And then there was the concept of the national covenant. And it was in our Pledge of Allegiance, it is in our Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. There would be the assumption that if this nation would be undivided, if it would be one, if it would be jam-packed with liberty and justice for every citizen, then it would have to be covenanted underneath God. Let me put it another way. The assumption was if God was not a part of the equation, then unity would be in trouble, liberty would be in trouble, and justice would be in trouble because the relationship to God was not as it ought to be. A covenant is a divinely created relational bond. It's an agreement that one of those four entities, or all four, agree to be covered by God because a covenant is designed to cover, like an umbrella. An umbrella doesn't stop it from raining, it just stops it from raining on you because you are covenantally covered. God made it clear in Psalm 33 verse 12 that the nation would be blessed who recognized him. And to recognize him would not only be to recognize his person, but also his policies, which is why he set forth policies alongside of his person 
that would govern the covenant that would benefit the nation who not only ascribed to them, but lived by them. Our series is kingdom voting. We have already said what kingdom voting is. It is the opportunity and responsibility of citizens to partner with God, to expand his rule in society through civil government. It is incumbent upon Christians to first and foremost ascribe themselves not to a political party, but to the superintending governance of God through civil government. It is to the degree that we operate under this umbrella, under this alignment with God, when it comes to your voting and your participation in the politics of the day, whether you lean Democrat or Republican, it is your kingdom centeredness because you're covenantally aligned that should influence, guide, and govern your vote. The Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, which says this, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Okay? I hope you caught that. If you want the right kind of government, God must be in the equation. Let me put it another way. The further you remove God's person and God's policies, because a lot of folk believe in God's person who ignore his policies, then you have removed yourself from the place of blessing and covering as a nation. Or to put it another way, the further you remove God's person and policies from what a government believes, how a government uh, operates, the character of the leaders who make up that government, then you have removed yourself from divine blessing. No matter how much you pray and no matter how much you use his, the God word, he says, then you have messed with God's authority and you've messed with God's ordinance. The Bible is pregnant with politics. From Genesis to Revelation, you see God all up in politics, setting up governments, taking down governments, giving laws, uh, judging lawbreakers. He's all up in politics and nations. He makes it a comprehensive statement. He says all authorities, plural. That means your mayor, <laughs> your city council. That means your state legislature. That means your governor. That means your house of representatives. That means your senate. That means your president. All authorities to the degree that they are aligned with God's person and God's policies is to the degree you'll have a unified nation, a free, la free nation, a just nation, and a righteous nation. Conversely, to the degree you're unaligned is to the degree that chaos will replace order. So let me make it easy for you and me. I'm going to give you one thing to vote for. And if you vote for this one thing, you're going to cover everything. I know it sounds simplistic because there's so many uh, laws and people and perspectives, but I'm going to give you a superintending, that is an overarching covenantal definition of civil government. And if you vote for this one thing, now everybody's not going to vote the same but if you have the same kingdom worldview as you vote, as you go to the ballot box, you will be thinking like a kingdom voter, whether you are leaning Democrat or leaning Republican. Remember, if you're going to be a kingdom independent, 
That means you're a Democrat light or Republican light because you're not fully committed either way. Here is the role of civil government. The biblical role of civil government as outlined in Romans 13 is to maintain a safe, just, righteous, and compassionately responsible environment for freedom to flourish. Let me say that again. The biblical role of civil government is to maintain a safe, a just, a righteous, and a compassionately responsible environment for freedom to flourish. Now we'll talk about freedom a little bit later in our series. But for right now, if you look for that definition and how it is flushed out in the political parties, you can, you can align them to what closest fits God's kingdom definition of government because then you're voting for God. That is, you're voting for God's perspective and policies that inform that goal. Now, again, people will come at this differently because they come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different priorities. I am not insisting that everybody vote one way. I am insisting everybody votes. But I am giving you a framework through which you look at the person and the policies. It must be both that you look to as you cast your vote as a kingdom independent. You cannot remove God's perspective from government and have an ordered society. It will either become a, a, a chaotic environment, it'll become anarchy, it'll become oppressive, it'll become so free that there are no standards. I mean, it'll go all over the place because there is no superintending standard by which you're measuring how you approach the concept of voting. Now, people, when they hear that, get a little nervous because they say, Evans, are you purporting a theocracy? Well, let me explain something. You're too late. The Bible declares that the world is already a theocracy because the Bible declares that God rules over all. In fact, Psalm 22, 28 says the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. So God is already ruling over everything. What ought to concern you is an ecclesiocracy. That is where a particular religion or uh, a particular uh, 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 faith governs the society. But you cannot have God removed and have an ordered society because then you wind up with homocracy. That is, where man is seeking to replace God in the name of government. So I want you to get this perspective. Leave God out. Government is in trouble, so the citizenry is in trouble. Bring God in, policies in person. Then you have a much more ordered environment in which to live and fulfill the role of safety, justice, righteousness, and compassion, all working together to help a hurting nation like ours right now. Now, the idea of government is to mirror or to reflect the image of God for the well-being of society. When God established the nation Israel, he gave them a constitution. We have a constitution. He gave them a constitution with 10 amendments. We call them the 10 commandments, okay? That constitution, and he gave them, that's why it, uh, the courthouse would have the 10 commandments in them. He said, I'm gonna give you 10 things. I'm gonna make this real easy. Then I'm gonna give you 613 statutes and ordinances which is the application of the Ten Commandments in the situations and circumstances of living together in society. I'm going to give you Ten Amendments to this Constitution, 613 statutes and ordinances, so you can apply these ten to your life's reality. And if you do this, you will be underneath my covenant, Deuteronomy 29.9, and you will be blessed. So if you really want to see our nation healed and helped, as you look at voting and politics and government, you better bring God's 
person in perspective and put it on front page because once or as he's excluded, that vacuum will be filled with that which will destroy the nation, not heal it. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, he says, because they no longer wanted to retain the knowledge of God. They, 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 didn't want, they didn't want his perspective anymore. God released them, turned them over, and he allowed decay to enter their world and their society. If you're tired of decay, as a kingdom voter, as a representative of the king, then that means you're gonna take seriously this responsibility to vote God back in and his perspective, which means your whole rule is accountable, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, to his perspective on whatever the issue is. Ah, but as long as the evil one can keep us illegitimately divided by making us more Democrat than Christian or more Republican than Christian, make our alliances more to homocracy than the rule of God, then we are aiding and abetting the deterioration and the destruction of the culture. Now in our series, we'll get to some of the specific issues, but I want you to get this framework because I want you to be a kingdom independent. What I'm saying to you is government is not only a political enterprise, it is a sacred enterprise because it involves God. It is a spiritual enterprise. What discourages me is when the spiritual is brought up, people get offended. They don't, they, they, they don't want to hear it. When you bring what God says about justice or, or brutality or race or life, they start going into, I, my, I think, I feel, or my opinion is, no, you don't get to have an opinion that disagrees with God. You, you, you may have it, but you need to switch it, change it. Because if government belongs to God, you better get his opinion and adjust your opinion. But the mere fact we spend more time getting folks' opinion before we get God's opinion on particular issues, no wonder the nation is in chaos because God's people are in chaos and not addressing issues comprehensively, picking and choosing, and not understanding that all of government is to come under his reign if you want the order that he gives. Like Daniel chapter 5, verse 21 says, the most high rules over the affairs of of men on all government levels. So, now you have a framework. You're gonna be a kingdom voter, then you're gonna partner with God in your vote. And his definition of civil government, to maintain a safe, just, righteous, and compassionately responsible environment for freedom to flourish. You know, he talks about the ordinance of God in verse two. In other words, God has rules, right? the ordinance of God. You don't make up rules even when it comes to government. You find out his rules and you obey those ordinances, those governing guidelines. That's why the Pledge of Allegiance and the idea of America is so great because it recognized that there are inalienable rights given by the creator that belongs to all men. And that if we're under God, we benefit from that. I am the... Uh, president of my house, okay? I'm the, I'm the potentate of my, of, of my crib where I live, all right? As my kids were growing up, they would often bring in ideas that were foreign to my governing guidelines. I would say, this is what we do in our house, this is how we do it. But because of peer pressure, because of what they were learning in school, because of the ones they were playing ball with, because of their friends, they would bring in perspectives that did not go along with my headship over my house. That would inevitably create a conflict between me and them. Because in my house, my rules should rule as long as my rules were consistent with God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So as long as I'm consistent with him, Foreign rules needed to be 
resisted and rejected no matter how many people they came from and no matter how much the majority said it, if it disagreed with the head, guess what? This country said it was God's house. We said one nation under God said we're going to be God's house. If you're going to be God's house, then it doesn't matter what everybody else says if the head of the house has spoken on any given subject. And so God is calling a nation of citizens to recognize his rules. He goes on to say, for rulers, verse 3, are not a cause for fear for good behavior, but for evil. That's safety. But that's also righteousness. He says, there's good behavior, there's bad behavior. Well, now, wait a minute. If there's good behavior and bad behavior, who's defining what's good and what's bad? Because once everybody gets to define it as they think it is, then you can have competing definitions of goodness. Good is because God says it's good. Bad is because God says it's bad. That's why the Ten Commandments was thou shalt not. He was giving a standard of good and bad. That's why we have laws, to give a standard of good and bad. He says that those ordinances come from God. Now, that means not only is there a standard of right and wrong, that means you have to know what that standard is. And the ordinance comes from God. Oh, if we would take this definition of government seriously and a vote, vote accordingly and bring God's perspective appropriately to bear on every system of government, then we would bring healing to the land, unity to the land, because if people learn to operate by the rules of engagement that were righteous and just and unifying, and if our leaders use their position to bring justice and righteousness and unity so that we can experience the freedom God offers as he defines it, then our nation would take on a different template the Bible says in Deuteronomy 4.8 that nations became great because they followed God's righteous laws. If we're going to experience help and healing in our country, then your vote has to vote for God's way, whether you vote or Democrat or Republican, because once you come out the booth, you're only going to follow God's prescription as we will see defined as we go along. So, he calls those who are in power, the political leaders, verse four, for it is a minister, referring to the rulers of God, to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Guess what he calls a civil leader? A minister. Now I know we think of ministers as preachers, right? The pre person behind the pulpit, and that, that is a minister. In fact, every Christian is called to be a minister on some level. But he calls now civil servants ministers. And not only call them ministers, he calls them ministers of God. Now we know in the ministry you can have a bad minister and you can have a good minister. They still give them the title minister, but that doesn't mean they're good ministers. It just means they hold the position of minister. In fact, some countries call their civil servants ministers. The minister here over Rome was a bad dude. He was terrible, Nero, but he held the position. You can have a bad political leader. You can have a good political leader. The job of Christians is to call them into account personally and policy-wise, to be good ministers. You don't just pick policy and skip person. You don't just skip person and grab policy because the ordinances are in the hands of the minister. And the minister is a person, he says, their ruler. You call for both. Some people talk about policy. Some people talk about person. No, if you're going to be a minister of God, you're supposed to be a good one in both categories. He says they are to represent God in good. 
He says they don't bear the sword in vain. Um, a Roman soldier, they were the policemen of the day, they carried the sword. The sword was for two things, intimidation. When you saw them coming, you go in, oh, we better not do this. Uh, the, the soldiers are here. And it was for judgment and justice to keep evil from proliferating. Whether it was evil by the citizenry or evil by the leaders. The sword was a place of intimidation and judgment, meaning evil would not be ignored. Why? Because you want a safe, just, and righteous environment. Because freedom can't flourish if there is no safety, if there is no righteousness, and if there is no just justice. And so he calls on them to hold and administer a standard of righteousness. In fact, 1 Timothy 2.2 2 says to pray for your leaders, pray for your politicians, that they may create an environment of peace. And so we are to hold our leaders accountable for the peacefulness of the environment in which we live. So, what's our standard? What are we going to use to judge it? Is it, is it um, what I think, how I feel, how I was raised, what I prefer? I remember the movie Inception. That was one of the most um, brain-straining movies in the history of movies. Here's a guy who got into other people's dreams to figure out what they were thinking based on what they were dreaming. He got so deep into other folks' dreams that he didn't know whether he was in a dream or in reality because he had gotten so deep into their thinking that he didn't know where he was. He was all confused at the things happening around him. So to help him out, he got a spinning top. It was a tool he used. And this spinning top was a tool to help him know whether he was in dreamland, dream world, or whether he was in reality. Because the voices were coming at him and he'd gotten so used to living in this dream world, he didn't know whether he was in it or out of it. He would spin the top. He knew that if the top never stopped spinning, he was in the dream world. He wasn't in reality. He also knew if the top started wiggling and wobbling and fell over, then that meant he was in real time and space, and therefore he was in reality. In other words, there was so much coming at him that he needed an objective standard outside of himself to tell himself what reality really was. Well, we're dealing with an inception situation right now. You got Democrats, you got Republicans, you got Libertarians, you got this issue, that issue, two parts of the same issue. You've got police, you've got community, and you've got arguments coming at both sides. You've got this politician, that politician, and it's coming at us. And sometimes you don't know which world you're in. You, you fluctuate, well, I like this over here, but I don't like that over there. I like this over here, but I don't like that over there. And you can wind up being totally confused. So you need a tool, something to help you discriminate through all the muck and mire of the confusion as you consider who you're going to vote for. You need a tool. That tool has to be the divine standard. On each issue, your, the, your first question is not who you're going to vote for. That's a secondary question. I know it's the one we talk about. The first question is, who does God want me to vote for? Now, based on the issues, every Christian still won't vote the same, but they should ask the same question because you're a kingdom independent. What's the tool? What's the, what's the scripture saying about the issue? And you go to that first and you don't get mad if the scripture says something other than you think or believe. You affirm yourself to the sovereignty of God because he rules the nations. And I love Proverbs 8, 15. He says, by me, kings reign. By me, kings reign. So if you want a king to rule right, a politician to rule correct, 
So they got a rule by me. I set the standard. Government is to execute safety. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, this just execution of safety should be done quickly so that people do not have to live in fear. It must be done justly, however. Uh, but then it says in chapter 12, verse 19, when government does this, you cannot take personal retribution. He says that. In other words, you don't become your own government. It's like a, uh, uh, a basketball game or football game. What do they have? They've got refs. What do they do? They govern the game. Now, if you start taking matters into your own hand illegitimately, then they will throw a penalty on you, even if you weren't the one in the wrong because you took matters into your own hands. That's why you must have a righteous government who will take matters quickly and make righteous judgments quickly and just judgments quickly so the citizenry doesn't think it has to take matters illegitimately because there are legitimate ways to take them, but illegitimately in their own hands. So this principle of government, God's covered everything. There is not one issue in government that you can come up with to which God has not given a precept or a principle to govern how you should view that issue. And if only Christians would vote with that world covenantal worldview in mind. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 5, 20 and 21, that when people call good evil and evil good, and they get this thing all mixed up, then it says that confusion comes and people are, are, are discombobulated. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20 says, if you, if you bypass God's rule, you don't have the dawn. In other words, you can't see straight. And I think there's a lot of blindness today all around, both parties, on the police side, on the citizen side, everywhere. There's blindness. Why? Because people have not decided to keep God in government which is what the scripture says you must do. Therefore, he says, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And we're going to give you a whole message on your conscience. Try to do that before it's time to vote. Because we want to help you to see how your conscience should influence which lever you pull or which ballot you respond to. So, God must be included in government in order to have government function in the way God designed it to function. To promote the good, to keep evil from proliferating, and let him decide what's good and what's not good. Psalm 72, 11, I love this verse. It says, he wants all leaders and all nations to serve him. Guess what? That means the U.S. of A all leaders and all nations to serve him. But then people get offended when you bring God's perspective. Well, this is not a time, Christians, for cute Christianity. This is not a time to placate the masses. This is a time for Christians to take their stand. If we would ever become unified, everybody would have to deal with us. But because we've been diver diverted into various parties, okay, they still should have to deal with you from a kingdom perspective. A kingdom voter brings a biblical worldview to the ballot box. A kingdom voter votes for the person and the policies that will best advance the kingdom of God and the definition of civil government that I have articulated for you today. That's what kingdom of voting is all about. Now, that will affect your view of justice. That will affect your view of, of uh, discrimination. That will affect your view of abortion. Yes, that will affect your view of marriage. Yes, that will affect your, your, your view of taxation. All of that, because God, guess what? God's got a view on all that. He doesn't have, he has more than a view, he has a rule. And if you and I would take this rule seriously, then Christians could lead the way. Because, you know, as you've heard me say, Christians are one of the major problems. 
because we, we haven't been kingdom minded. We've been more cultural minded and political party minded that we've not set the stage. And so we have contributed to the chaos greatly. But now is the time in the midst of the chaos that we can step forward and set a new temperature. In Genesis chapter 11, the first nine verses, God let there be confusion in the land because they wanted society without him. And the Bible says, and so there was confusion. You leave him out of your vote, of our vote, on person and policy. There will be more confusion in the land. And we're the ones who have what God thinks. But what we've done is we've allowed our own identities, our own races, our own preferences to keep us from taking a comprehensive stand on righteousness and justice in the life of our society. So, you remove being under God, we remove being under God, we will discover we are a nation gone under. We remove under God, in practice, we will be a nation gone under. You're seeing it, it's right before your eyes, but God has given us a brief opportunity to turn this thing around. If we will operate as a nation, covenantally, as kingdom voters. You know, the Queen of England is greatly, she's greatly respected. She's held in high esteem. When she's in town versus out of town, they raise a lower the flag at Buckingham Palace because the queen is either here or not here. On a regular basis, the prime minister sits down with the queen of England to update her on everything major happening in the United Kingdom. The queen of England is highly highly honored, but she has absolutely no power. She doesn't determine any laws. She doesn't, she doesn't act in a governance role. She's, she's highly positioned, but when it comes to policy, that's something she's informed about, not something she determines. It reminds me of how we view God. We hold him in high esteem. In God we trust, it's on our money. One nation under God. It's in our Pledge of Allegiance. In our Declaration of Independence, we say, by our Creator, we begin political events with invocations, we close them with benedictions. He is held in high esteem. But when it comes to how the nation operates, and often how Christians vote, he has no clout at all. We could care less what he thinks, what he says, and how he feels about it, because this is how I feel and what I think. We'll keep him in position because we'll go to church. We'll sing our songs. We'll wave our hand in the air like we just don't care. We'll give him position while ripping him a power. If you and I want to see a nation healed and helped, then we must not extract God from government. And that should be manifested in your thinking as you go into the voting booth. Wow, what a message to help us remember to make the connection, making the connection between God and government and government and God, because God is sovereign. There's nothing that happens that he's shocked about. There's nothing that happens that he's unaware of. God is in control, and that's what we have to have faith in during this season. It's also important for us to make the connection with our salvation. For those of you who have trusted Christ and given your life to him and placed faith in him and received grace based on the blood that was shed for you, we wanna to commune together. We wanna to have an intimate time with him. So if you get your cracker and get your bread and Get your juice or your water in your hands right now. We want to remember 
the sacrifice that was made. Isaiah 53 lets us know that he was bruised for our iniquities, that it was us, that we were the ones that, that sinned against him. We were once enemies of God, but by his work, we are healed. And we are healed by his body that was broken for us. And when he had the last supper with his disciples, he told them to take this bread and eat in remembrance of his brokenness so that we can be whole. Let's eat together. It's exciting to continue to make this connection with his blood. You got to make the connection with his blood because we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 9 says. And so his blood gives us healing. It's the blood that flows through the body that keeps it alive. And it ultimately spiritually gives us life, the blood that was shed so that we can live in eternity with him because of the sacrifice that he, that he made. So let's drink together in remembrance of his sacrifice. It's always exciting to commune together, all of us, the whole church of Jesus Christ from wherever you are, to remember the sacrifice that he's made and also to remember that it's God who connects to government and government who connects to God. There is, uh, th there is no uh, uh, distinction between the two as it relates to the sovereignty of God. And we have to make sure that we remember that always. We're excited that you joined us. Remember, we're back again next week, Sunday morning, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. You can go to ocbfchurch.org, OCBF YouTube, OCBF Facebook, and we can't wait to worship with you again next week. We'll see you soon. Blessings.